Good morning, and thank you for streaming with us here live at Rooted Bible Fellowship Church, where our pastor is Pastor Kevin L. Webster and our First Lady Sharon Webster. We pray that the word is encouraging and uplifting to your spirit today. And with that being said, let's hear a word from our pastor. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout. Thank the Lord for the miracles he gives us every day. Amen. We give honor to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords in this great day of worship. Amen. We're so excited to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Amen. The Lord has made a way for us. He has blessed us. He has spoken to us. He has delivered us. He has made a way for us all week. Amen. He's ordered our steps all week. Amen. Kept us from all hurt, harm, and danger. And just because of that, give the Lord a shout of praise just for keeping you. Amen. Amen. You did not keep yourself. Amen. The Lord, he dispatched his angels, the Bible says, and gave them charge over thee. Amen. And so we thank the Lord for his goodness, his grace, and his mercy. He is so kind to us, and we can never repay him for all the great things he has done for us. And the greatest thing that he's done for us, he's given us eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. Give the Lord a shout of praise for that. Hallelujah. I may not have all the money in the world or the house on the hill, but I do have eternal life. Amen. And that's the greatest gift that a man, woman, boy, or girl can have. And we greet you today in the matchless, majestic name of a wonderful Savior, Jesus. It is Communion Sunday. It's a day that we come together as a body of believers. Do not get caught up in this world. Get caught up with the philosophy that you don't need church. That's straight from the pit, amen? We need church. We need each other, amen? We need to rub up against each other. We need to encourage one another. We need to stimulate one another. We need to provoke one another unto good works. Amen. This is still the time for the New Testament church to be the New Testament church. I don't care about no pandemics. I don't care about this new wave of stuff going on in the world. We are still called to be the New Testament church. Is that all right? Amen. So don't get caught up in this new movement about I don't need church. If you saved you need church. Let me say that again. If you're born again, you need church. Amen? Amen. Amen. We want to get started as we look at the stewardship of money is one of the most neglected areas in the believer's life. We don't mind talking about justification. We don't mind talking about sanctification. We don't mind talking about miracles. We just got finished singing the song. Everybody was up, up in the mountaintop. Amen. He's a miracle working God. We don't even mind talking about healing because he's a healing God. Uh, we don't mind talking about blessings. And I don't know about you. He has blessed me very well. Anybody else can testify. And we don't mind talking about spiritual warfare. But the stewardship of the believer's financial responsibility always gets lost in church life. Amen. Listen uh, this morning, how we get money, how we spend money, how we invest money, and how we give out money is of utmost importance to the God that we serve. Did you hear me? Don't try to separate money from God. Amen. We got a lot of folks try to separate. Amen. They try to separate money from God. And so as we look at this, we want to learn and grow. Like I said, I haven't preached a series since 2012. Ask the Lord to forgive me because guess what? I should have been doing a little bit more regular. So there's a repentance on my part. Amen. Amen. And so we want to look at this and we want to uh, understand this. Listen, my job as your pastor is to teach you what God says about his money. My job is not to beat you up about giving. My job is not even to motivate you to give. That's God's job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But my job is to teach you what thus says the Lord when it comes down, watch this, to his money. And so we want to go back to our study. I don't know, I was looking at a fourth part 
study, but as I was studying this week, it may take us a little bit longer. We're just going to call it our Sunday series. And we want to go back today. We gave you notes and we're going to do some study. I'm in a teaching mode. Amen. Uh, and we're going to teach this. Uh, we want to talk about God's money plus God's way equal God's blessing. Let me say that again. God's money, God's way equal God's blessing. Amen. The preaching on money should never be intended. It's never, it never should be intended to promote guilt. But instead, it's intended, watch this, to promote obedience, spiritual maturity, earthly and heavenly wealth. Don't you know that you can have earthly and heavenly wealth if you do right by God's money? Let me say that again. You can have earthly and heavenly wealth if you do right, watch this, by God's money. Amen. I want you to get that today. Amen. And so we want to go back to our sermon and we want to preach from a sermon topic today, just for today. Whose money is it really? Oh, I got that. For some strange, unrealistic, untruthful reason, we ultimately truly believe that the money that we possess is actually our money. Amen. And that's where the problem lies. Amen. The problem lies where we think that it's our money instead of God's money, amen? And the moment you start thinking that it's your money, watch this, you'll get stingy, you'll hold on to it. But once you realize it's God's money, you realize you're nothing but a steward, amen? You're nothing but a manager, amen, over what God has entrusted to each one of us. So let's look at this. Let's, let's, let's grow from this. Let's stand. Let's read a portion of scripture this morning amen we're in church and and Jesus makes a profound statement Jesus king of kings lord of lords makes a profound statement and we're going to grow from this we're going to look at this and Jesus does something here in Luke 16 I put it up on the screen but I want us to look at it in Luke 16 amen verses 10 through 13 listen what Jesus says Look what he says. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches? Here we go. And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Here we go. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus connects something here. He connects wealth with the spiritual realm. He connects money with our spiritual life. And also, watch this. He connects money with our future eternal position. You didn't know that, did you? He connects wealth on this side with our position on the other side of the Jordan. I want you to see how serious it is with the Lord when it comes down to his money. Amen. And our responsibility one day in heaven, he connects it with the earthly resources that he's given us on this side. Father, bless as only you can. Speak to us, grow us up, strengthen us, oh God, as a body of believers. And let us learn how to be obedient to your word. Let us get away from this world's mentality, oh God. Me, mine, and myself. And let us focus on your word and your word says it is more blessed to give than to receive we thank you lord now take this church higher higher into the higher heights and lead us through the deeper depths grow us up and speak life to us tear away the strongholds tear away the generational curses that's been holding our family in bondage with money for years speak a rhema word through this series in jesus name we pray let the church say amen. 
may have your seats. Jesus connects money with or wealth with spiritual realm. Amen. And he connects. He says, if you, if you can't be entrusted with the little bit on this side, how am I going to entrust you with the spiritual blessings on the other side? Don't you know that one day we're going to be on the other side? Don't you know either you're going to die, experience a physical death, amen, and be in his presence, or you're going to be raptured as he cracks the sky? But either way, watch this, we're going to be in the new Jerusalem. And what you do on this side, amen, what you do on this side, we're not angels, we're not no angels. I don't want to hear about we flying around and we got wings. We ain't never got no wings. Amen, we are, we are living and because of faithfulness on this side determines your position and responsibility when we get into the New Jerusalem. You better, you better grab this. New Jerusalem is forever and forever. This earthly side is maybe 70, 80, 90, even 100 years, but it's temporary. And so Jesus connects wealth with spirituality. Amen. Listen, our attitude and the use of money, brothers and sisters, watch this is spiritual to Jesus. Let me say that again. It's spiritual to Jesus. The stewardship of God's money is spiritual, church, and I don't want you to miss that. I don't want you to miss that. Amen? I don't want you to miss this. Watch this. Here we go. Watch this. Money is life. Money is life. And, I, and it simply means this. When I say money is life, uh, we spend all of our lives trying to get money. Yes, we do. Huh? So that we can what? Stay alive. Am I right about it? Uh, and function and, and, and operate in this life. And so we spend a lot of our earthly life with our minds and our attitude towards money. Amen? It, it was an article that was penned, and it said that we spend 50% of our time thinking about how to get money how to spend it, how to save it, how much we have to pay out, amen, paying them bills, right? And, and then we spend 50% of our time thinking like this, how can I keep it, amen? And so with that, watch this, that is why the issue of money is so important to God because even though money, watch this, even though money itself is amoral, Meaning that it's not good or bad, amen? But watch this, money is either, it either has a righteous ramification or money has an unrighteous or unrighteous ramification. And the way that we view it, the way that we view it, the way that we handle it uh, is utmost importance to God. The way that you spend it is important to God, amen? See, watch this. Wasting money is important to God. Spending money frivolously is important to God. How you invest it is important to God. How you give it is important to God. And watch this, Rooted. Even how you think about money is important to God. Amen? And so as we look at this, we must understand that these are things that are important to God. Where a man's treasure is, so lies his heart. Am I right? The best financial advisor that we have, the best financial advisor and investment broker is God. God, if you, if you want to understand about investment, if you want to understand, uh, understand about how to multiply, you need to learn it from God himself. Because what God does through his son Jesus Christ, he gives us a clear biblical pattern for the believer to follow. He gives us everything that we need so we can be wealthy, successful, prosperous on this side. Amen? And so as we understand this, we got to look at this. And, and, and our money habits is very important to God. Watch this. Please understand this. The statement. The love of money may be the root of all kinds of evil. Put that up on the screen. But the misuse of money is the beginning of many of life's problems. Amen? A lot of our generational curses comes from, watch this, the misuse of money. 
the misuse of money that our great-grandparents did, our, our great-grandparents and our grandparents and our parents did. Amen. It's a generational curse that's passing on down from generation to generation. Watch this. It's the misuse of money. And some of us right now are feeling the effects of a generational curse. And it's sad to say, watch this, sad to say, and I'm going to say this because I'm in this community, within the black community, we struggle in this area of finances. You ain't got to agree. Why? Because we don't understand the use of money, and it's so evident. Anytime that we will buy an expensive car, but we still living in an apartment. Huh? We don't understand the misuse of money. Anytime we'll put $250 tennis shoes on our children and, and put $300, um, 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 $100 worth of jeans on them and gear, but we ain't putting no money away for college and no future investment, we don't understand. And it's the misuse of money. And it creates, watch this, a generational curse. Oh, you ain't got to work with me today. We're so, we're so um, caught up in how we look and, and keeping up with the Joneses that we ain't doing right by way of God's money and we want to know why we ain't got nothing. And so as we look at this, we got to come to the reality. We got to get to the reality, Rooted Bible. Watch this. We get to the reality that all money belongs to God. Huh? From that little penny. Amen. They used to have it. They don't have it no more. You may get one. If you get one, let me know. Amen. To that thousand dollar bill it used to be such thing as a thousand dollar bill. Amen. They stopped circulating them. Amen. But all of it belongs to God. All money, all your money in the bank, all your money in your retirement. All your money that you possess, it all belongs to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. And this is the first place that we got to get to. Because once you realize that, watch this, you'll then fall to the humble place that you're nothing but a steward over God's stuff. He says in, in the book of Haggai, he says in Haggai 2.8, he says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. Everybody see that? He says, It is all mine. And so as a believer, we have to recognize that it all belongs to God. Amen? So, so as we look at this, we want to understand something. Let's set it up today. We're going to set it up. The question on the floor is this. Is it wrong for Christians to have money? Amen. Ain't nothing wrong with having no dollars now. There's nothing wrong with having dollars. Matter of fact, watch this. We're going to learn something. See, it's God who gives each one of us wealth. It's God who determines the wealth that you and I will have in this life. And that's what we got to understand. Watch this. You're not going to go outside of God's allotted will for you. I don't care how much you lie, scheme, whatever you do, you won't go outside of what God has already allotted for you on this side of the Jordan. See, watch this. Before you was created, God already knew what he was going to give you, how he was going to give it to you, how much he was going to give you. He already knew before you was even created, before he even found the world, he already knew about your allotment. That's why you ain't got a big ball still covered nobody else's stuff. Look at what I know what what God has for you. He got for you. Huh? No, it's not wrong for a Christian to have no money. Matter of fact, as we look at this, it tells us God grants to men and women the ability to earn that which he has given them. Did you get that? Look what it says. It says you may say to yourself. My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. That's the problem right there. But watch this. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability. Huh? He gives you the ability to do what? To produce wealth. Ain't nothing wrong with having some wealth now. And ain't nothing wrong with having a couple of nickels rubbed together. Amen. Ain't nothing wrong with it. But you got to recognize who gave you the power to produce it. God says, I'm the one who gave you the power. And so confirm his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. So the first thing we have to understand is that all money belongs to God. It's all the Lord's. And so when you recognize this, watch this, you don't start holding it like this. And, when it, and watch this, and if it ever leaves you, you don't find yourself jumping out of the window because you recognize that it all belongs to God. 
the Lord give it and the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So as we look at this, watch this. Money, brothers and sisters, we're talking about money today. Money is God's gift to us. Money is God's gift. Amen. For the Bible tells us this. Watch this. It says, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? What do you have that you did not receive? That nice car, how did you get it? God gave it to you. That nice house, God gave it. Those clothes, jewelry, God gave you all that stuff that you did not receive. And if you did not, and if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? And so as we look at this, we got to understand that money is God's gift. Amen? Isn't that good stuff? And he has allotted to each one of us a measurement of wealth. And this is where contentment comes in. You got to understand your measurement of wealth. See, I already know that I ain't going to never be no millionaire. Amen? That's not my lot. And there may be somebody else's lot in here. I hope it is. I hope somebody else in here got to get a million dollars. Amen? Praise the Lord. Because I know it's going someone that's going to come to the storehouse, right? Yeah, right, 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 right. But it's God's gift unto man. Amen? There's an old adage that says this the poor you are the more spiritual you are that's not true because watch this you got poor greedy people that don't have nothing just like you got rich greedy people that got something so that old adage that the poor that I am the less that I have that that I'm more spiritual no that's not true Amen? That's not true. And so we have to understand this, and we got to understand that money is God's gift to man. And God, watch this, brothers and sisters, God desires. Tell your neighbor, God desires. He desires for man, for, watch this, let me make sure I put a, put a handle on this. He desires for godly folks. Amen? Godly folks, those who belong to him. Godly folks, he desires for them to prosper. All through scriptures, we see the folks that belong to God, God wants them to prosper. God is not stingy. No, God wants them to be prosperous. He wants them to be fruitful. He wants them to walk in wealth. We see it all through the scriptures. We see God desires for man to be prosperous. Come here, Abram. Amen. Who had become very wealthy. How? By God. In livestock and, and in silver and in gold. God is the one who made Abraham wealthy. Come here, Isaac. And come here, Jacob. They all had something. Amen. They all had a measure of wealth. Amen. Come here, brother Job. Oh, brother Job. Check out brother Job. It says in Job 1, 2, and 3, he had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke. That's wealth. So we see that, watch this, God desires that we possess wealth. I don't want you to walk away with this old evangelical teaching that we're supposed to be poor. No, no, no. That we're going to understand the, the difference between biblical wealth and worldly wealth. You got to understand that. But if we sit, look at this, watch this. We see all through the scriptures, come here, David. Come here, Lydia. You, you seller of purple, you entrepreneur. Amen. We see this all through scriptures. Esther, and, and watch this. Come here, you Zebedee boys. Amen. Got that lucrative fishing company with you and your dad amen look at all that God has blessed you so we stop out and let you know that God desires for us to have a measure of wealth everybody receive that but watch this this is what we get to this is what we understand money money as we look at this man is the one who perverts God's gift it's man who messes up God's gift it's man who now takes what God has intended for good and make his bad. Amen. First Timothy 6, um, um, 6, 10 says, for the love of money. That's when all you think about is your dollar. It's all about your money. Amen. The love of money is the root of all kinds of it. I've seen so many couples break up over money. I've seen marriages go by the wayside over a dollar. I've seen relationships get messed up over a dollar. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. 
And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. Amen. Money has taken them away from the things of God, the love of Christ, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit and pierced themselves what? With many griefs. See, he shows us right here that we can pervert this good thing that God has given us. And watch this. It brings forth many griefs. How in the world over money? This lawyer down in South Carolina, and I'm standing on YouTube, Murdoch, how you going to kill your wife? And how you going to kill your son because you in money problems? Why? Because the love of money. It's the love of money that is the root of all sorts of evil. And when you love money, you'll find yourself doing all kinds of things. You'll find yourself doing some things that you say that you will never do all over a dollar. It's the love of money. Money is amoral. Money is a tool. Money is a resource that God uses. Money isn't good or bad. And so as we look at this, money, brothers and sisters, is never condemned in scriptures. Money is never condemned in scriptures, but it's the way that we handle money that is condemned. I want to turn real quick to a parable, and we won't read it all. I want you to read it in your own leisure, over in the book of Luke. In Luke, the 19th chapter, Jesus is the nobleman, and he gives us a parable about the 10 minutes. Amen? A measure of money. It's about three or four months worth of wages. And it talks about a nobleman who gives it to his servants. And if you go there and look at it real quick, we won't read it all, but when you get a chance, he says this. He says, a nobleman of Noble birth went to a distant country to have someone appoint him king. This is Jesus talking. And to return. Amen. Talking about himself. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minutes. But, but, but this, he says, put this money to work. Watch this. See, see, we have to understand something. As we look at this, God's financial system is different from the world's financial system. He tells them, this is money. He says, I want you, I'm going to give you an allotment of money, and I want you to put it to work. So watch this. When I return, watch this, there's an investment for me when I get back. So I'm going to give you an allotment of money. And he gave to each one of them an allotment of money, right? And you go ahead, you read the story, and he tells them to put it to work until he returns. And when he returns, he wants an investment. Watch this. Two of them did right by way of the money. They invested the money. They, they did what they supposed to do with the money, and, and, then, and then they invested it, and when he came, he said to them, he says, you are faithful. Well done. Well done. I don't know about you, but that's what I want Jesus to say to me one day. Well done, uh, 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 Pastor Webb. Well done. Anybody else want to hear that? Well done. You was faithful over the few things. I, he said, I gave you an allotment, and you invested it, and now I'm coming back, and I got a return on my investment. Amen, the parable. But then there was one. It was one who misused improper use of what God had given him. We got some folks like that right now. Amen. And instead, watch this, in his own intellect, in his own reasoning, in his own self-will, he says, well, I'm going to take the money and just put it away. But God says, no, nah, no, nah, I told you to make it work. But you're going to put it away, and that's how we are, amen? We decide what we want to do, how we want to do it, when we want to do it. But God says, no, this is what I told you to do, and be obedient to what I tell you. And we see in the end of the story with that one, we see the judgment that fell on that one. Why? It's not so much that money is condemned, but it's the misuse of money that's condemned. I remember when I was start preaching years ago almost 30 years ago and I went to a church and they only had about five members in the church I think it was my 1994 and I was preaching at a church it was like five folks at five six seven folks in the church and they took up an offering and I was working at that time for the federal government and and was making a little bit of something something making a little bit of cabbage amen can I get an amen and so when they took the offering up and they gave it six, seven, less than ten folks, and they presented it to me after I got friends preaching, you know, the honorarium, amen, a man is worthy of his heart. A man is worthy of his heart, right? A man is worthy of his heart. 
don't muzzle the ox who tread out the grain, am I right? And so they gave it to me, right? And when they gave it to me, I took it, I put it in my pocket. And then I went and I, and, I, and I said to them, and I went back, I got in the car and I went back and I gave it back to the preacher and I said, I said, um, no, y'all take this. I said, y'all take it back because y'all, y'all, y'all need it. Put it back, take it back. I'm in my mind. I'm thinking they need it more than I need it. So I'm thinking I'm doing something good. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good about myself. Amen. You ever feel good about yourself? I didn't done something. And a lot of y'all saying right now in your mind, amen, pastor. I go back to Shining Star Baptist Church with my pastor, James Johnson. I told him, I gave him the report about it I just preached. And he said, good, good boy, good. You know, ain't no too much accolades back in those days. Good, all right, you did what God called you to do, right? Uh, and I said, I gave the offering back. He said, you did what? I said, I gave the offering back, pastor. He said, man, don't you never do that again. He said, don't you never do that again. He said, in your mind, you thought that you did a right thing, young brother. He said, no, you didn't do a right thing. You robbed them of a blessing. See, they gave from the recesses of their heart to bless you. And what you did, you took it back and gave it back to them. You thought in your mind you was doing the right thing, but you didn't do what the Bible said. Ah. Some of y'all right now, y'all trying to wrap it around your mind. How, how was it wrong? See, I robbed them of a blessing. They were blessing me from the recesses of their heart. They was investing into the ministry that God had given to me. They were investing. They were sowing into the ministry that God had to begin with me. Because watch this. They wanted a harvest one day. They wanted a harvest. And all the souls that I led to Christ last 30 years will be on their account. So that one day when I see them on the streets of gold, they'll say, I invested in your ministry. And all that God God has given to you is now also bestowed into me. See, in our human reasoning, we want to do what we want to do opposed to what God say. Oh, you better walk with me today. And so as we look at this, we're going to talk about the biblical design. We're going to grow in these next couple of weeks. You want to learn something that you ain't never learned before. I'm, I'm going to show you something about the tithe that you never learned before. Some of you. And so watch this. The biblical design to help us to gain a measure of wealth. Is anybody in the house want a measure of wealth on this side? I'm going to raise my hand. Amen. Both hands. Amen. Because not only do I want a measure of wealth, but I want to pass it down. Huh? I want my grandchildren to walk in it. I want the great-grandchildren to walk in it. I may not never see it, but I want it to now. I want it to come all the way down. See, what we got today, we're thinking about ourselves. That's why we're spending up everything that we got. Because we're thinking about here and right now. But you ain't thinking about what God is trying to do through you, through the next generation. Bible, it's sin for us to leave this earth and not leave nothing. When you leave this earth, I don't care if you on, I don't care if you on disability, I don't care if you on social security, the Bible, and I'm gonna show it to you later on, that we are to leave something. It didn't say how much, but watch this. When you leave this earth, watch this, you're supposed to leave something. Oh Lord have mercy. Mm, mm, mm. I got an amen. We're in the back. This is how you get wealth. I'm going to give you four ways that you get wealth, biblically. Amen? I ain't talking about no gimmicks. I ain't talking about no, no get-rich-quick schemes that we got these slicksters. Everybody, uh, let me tell you something right now. That's false. That's false. I ain't talking about no, I ain't talking about no prayer cloths. I, I, I ain't talking about that. I, I, watch this. For some of you, don't get mad at me. I'm not even talking about no lottery. I'm not even talking about no lottery. I'm not talking about no casinos. I'm not talking about what Jamie Foxx is promoting, no sport betting. I ain't talking about getting, getting money like that. But I'm talking about God's way. Because watch this, when you do it God's way, the money lasts. The money lasts, why? Because it's his money. The first principle, in order to get wealth, you got to go to work, Jack. You got to go to work. 
you got to go to work, man. You got to go to work. You got to you got to put something together. Amen. Remember, uh, you got to watch this. You got to go to work. Amen. Stop trying to be slick. Stop trying to come up with other ways. Now watch this. We got to understand something real quick. I didn't want to miss this point. Worldly wealth is different from biblical wealth. Make sure you understand this. See, worldly wealth, we're looking at a measurement of what I have. Biblical wealth is this, to have something versus not having nothing. Biblical wealth is this. Yesterday in my bread, we used to have the bread box. Anybody remember the bread box? If you're 30, you don't remember no bread box. Don't even raise your hand. 40, don't, no, no, no. But if you're over 50, you remember the bread box. In my bread box, this is biblical wealth. In my bread box one day, there was no bread in the box. But in the next day, I go to the box, and there's a slice of bread that wasn't there before. Now I have it. Watch this. That's wealth. One time I only had one pair of shoes. Now I got two pair of shoes. That's wealth. One time I only had one winter coat. Now I got two winter coats. That's wealth. One time I had a whole hoopty. I got graded up to a, a little upgrade of a car. That's wealth. See, biblical wealth is not like worldly wealth. Biblical wealth says one time I had nothing compared to me having something. I am so wealthy. That's biblical wealth. See, the man with the church, church getting caught up in the world. Church looking at all these entertainers and stars and thinking that's wealth. No, biblical wealth is having something compared to having nothing. And if you got something, I stop by to tell you, sweetheart, you're wealthy. If you got something, if you got a little piece of money, you're wealthy. If you got a little piece of car, you're wealthy. If you got a couple of undergarments, ah, undergarments, ah, t-shirts, you're wealthy. Because biblical wealth means that one time I had nothing, but now I got something. So let's make sure we clear what biblical wealth is compared to worldly wealth. You got to go to work. Huh? That's what he says here. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Ain't going to eat. You ain't, you ain't working. You ain't, you ain't going to eat. Amen. And when your stomach starts to make that noise, it'll motivate you to go to work. And, and, and so I ain't working at no McDonald's. I, you, you miss enough meals. The thing that you say you'll never do, you'll find yourself flipping a burger. The one who is unwilling to work should not eat. We hear the some among you are idle and disruptive. They're not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and watch this and earn the food they eat. We got to learn this great lesson. How do you get wealth? You got to go to work. Don't you know that working builds up your self-respect? Don't you know that when you go to work and, and you work, don't you know it builds up your personhood of who you are and your self-respect? I ain't talking about the person that's disabled. I ain't talking about the person that can't work. I'm talking about the one who's able to work. Amen? See, 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 to be lazy brings you to poverty. To, to just talk work and don't go to work brings you down <laughs> to the poor house. So as we look at this, watch this. It says here, look at Proverbs 14, 23. All hard work brings a profit. Ain't nothing wrong with some hard work. Watch this. It brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Uh, just talking about going to work. We got a lot. They talking about I'm going to work. I ain't been to work yet. One thing God doesn't do, God doesn't drop down this from the sky. You got to go and put your feet to it. So we see here that the first thing of wealth is that you must go to work. 
Amen. He says here, watch this. A great example of this is the illustration that Proverbs, I'm almost done. Proverbs gives us the ant. If you ever want to see a smart creature, look at the ant. The ant is so, the ant is smarter than some human beings. Because the ant recognizes that there's a time coming that they ain't going to be able to work. The ant recognized, watch this, it says in the text that the ant, watch this, in Proverbs 6, verses 6 and 11, it said that the ant don't need no commander. That means the ant don't need no mama and daddy say, get up, get up. You got to go to work today. The, the, the ant don't need no commander. The ant says on her own, man, I got to get up and go make some money. It says it has no commander, no overseer. Or ruler, yet it stores its provision in the summer, gather its food in the harvest. And it says, how long will you lie there? You sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep and a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief. So watch this, Pastor Webb ain't got no, I ain't got no new revelation for you. I ain't going to tell you to go and grab a prayer coffin. I'm going to anoint your head with some oil and all of a sudden you're going to get some money from over yonder. No, I'm going to tell you this. Go get a job. Go to work. And so as we see this, he says the first thing for wealth is that we must go to work. Can I get an amen? amen. But the second principle, not only should we go to work, and I know this is foreign because we got a new group of folks coming up, they say, I ain't working for nobody. Well, uh, you got to learn how to work for somebody before you can learn how to work for yourself. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> you got to learn how to be disciplined under some, you know, we're in this world now, nobody want to fall under nobody. Nobody want to fall under no rule and no authority. But I stop by to let you know, once you learn how to fall under authority, then watch this, you'll learn how to, to allow other people to fall under your authority. If you've never fell under authority, then you can't lead with no authority. If you have never followed, you will never be a leader. See, to be a great leader, you got to first learn how to follow. You want to be a boss. A boss of what? You ain't never fouled under no boss and learn how to be a boss. And so the second principle, am I preaching today? The second principle for wealth. Anybody want some wealth? Who wants some wealth? Raise your hand. If you want some wealth, then you better learn how to save. I'm, hel I'm, I'm helping somebody. I'm helping somebody. You ain't got to say amen. You're in there. You get up now, somebody going to look at you. You ain't going nowhere. Amen. The principle is to save. It says over here in Proverbs 21, 20, the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but the fools gulps, there's down. Everything you get, you spend in it. Can't even hold on to it long enough. And you're not saving. If you notice anything about the ant, the smallest creature, the ant got so much common sense, it says that the ant stores away. Because the ant understands that there's a time of leanness. And you and I can understand that, watch this, it ain't always going to be like this. And there needs to be, there's some time of leanness. So to have a measure of wealth, they got to come with some saving. If you work, you should have something saved. We need to be teaching our grandchildren uh, how to put it. Back in the day, they had a piggy bank. Put that in the piggy bank. In the piggy bank, where you couldn't even get the money out, they had to stay in there. Only way you could get the piggy bank out, you had to break it. If you work, you should have something. Am I right about it? A good place is right here as we look at this. Watch this. Uh, it, it's you should have least watch this. I'm just I'm just I'm meddling right now Can I meddle for a second? You should have least at least a month two months worth of rent mortgage stored up somewhere Huh, don't keep buying all this jewelry and going all these places But you ain't got a month of mortgage a month of electric bill stored away somewhere at least two months or a month get I had to take a month some people say six months. I ain't gonna say get a month 
How in the world are you going to go on a cruise and a trip, but you ain't got no money in the bank? How are you going to be buying all this stuff, eating at restaurants, but you ain't got nothing in the bank? And every time you didn't charge it, charge it. You got to save it. You got to set aside margin. Tell your neighbor margin. Margin means to leave room. There should be margin at all. I don't care. You say, but you don't understand, Pastor. I'm making minimum wage. Nah, nah, nah. That don't make a difference. If you make anything, you should have some margin. You set aside margin. Notice the ant stored away. What is margin? Margin means that margin means that I'm leaving room. What you leaving room for? I'm leaving room for God, first and foremost. In my margin, there's room for God because it belongs to him. In my margin, I'm leaving room for others because I may have to bless somebody who's deserving of a blessing. Can I get a witness? When's the last time you blessed somebody? When's the last time you put something in somebody else's hand? Margin means this, that margin is there for my wants, not my needs. Every once in a while and every now and then, I'm going to treat myself. I'm going to do something. I'm going to go into my margin. Margin is for the unexpected stuff that comes in the life because it always, it always comes around. That unexpected thing is the same amount of money I got in the bank. Margin, watch this, y'all, is for the lean time. And if anybody, you've been living long enough, watch this, you know you've touched some lean times. You know you touched some times that it wasn't always prosperous, but I'm so glad that I was able to grab from the margin to bring the margin over into the budget. Can I get a witness up in here? You got to have some margin. Huh? You know, am, I, am I preaching to anybody? Huh, got to have some margin. Got to have something, amen, put away. Amen. You got to stop, uh, you got to stop uh, presuming the grace of God. Amen. You got to stop presuming the grace of God. Amen. You, 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 watch this. Presuming the grace of God, you're going to quit a job before you had another job. That's presuming the grace of God. Well, I'm leaving this job, but ho, ho, ho. You don't leave the job until you have another job. What you're doing, you're presuming the grace of God. Huh? See, we, 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 we understand this. We think that God, watch this, that God is going to bless our irresponsibility. We think that God is supposed to bless our irresponsibility, our presumptuous sin, that God, he's still going to take care of me. God allowed me to work 30 years, and I spent that whole 30 years wasting money, but now God, watch this, he's going to take care of me my retirement no no it don't work like that no no God says watch this you want some wealth you gotta save something can I get a witness watch this the third principle not only do you have to go to work not only should you have margin and save something but you should also plan write this down somewhere no budget or priority list leads to some bad stuff when you don't have a priority list and you don't have a budget, it leads to some bad stuff. Amen. Watch this. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 8 and 15, the wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways. But the folly of the fools is deception. It says that you want some wisdom. You got to think about it. This is money. You got to think. You got to put priorities. You got to put things in place. The simple believe anything. But the prudent give thought to their steps. Did y'all see that? It talks about those who plan, those who exercise wisdom, those who think through their stuff. Amen? And, and think through how they're going to work through certain things. I don't know about you, but every month, first lady sitting at me at a table, did you see this on this, on this, count, on this budget right here? Did you see this? this is what we got? Well, good. I need that because we need to budget. We got a plan. See, you just go on spending without planning leads to poverty. And so with this should be some plans. What is the priority? 
What's the listing of priorities? What do we do? And let me stop by to tell somebody, just in case you don't know this, watch this. The first priority is always this. We need a roof over top of our heads. And if everything else don't go, I'm going to pay my rent. I'm going to pay my mortgage. And I need me a little electricity. And I'm going to pay my BG&E if I don't pay nothing else. Keep a roof over the top of my head. And I like me some air and some heat every once in a while. And I like me some lights. Anybody else like lights? And I know the priority. So before we start spending all this money, watch this. We're going to make sure that mortgage is paid, that BG&E is paid, that car insurance. Because without car insurance, you ain't going to work. That car insurance. See, we got to set a priority list. You want to go get that suit? You want to go get that dress? Did we pay the mortgage yet? Did we pay the BG&E? Says you got a plan. Amen? Am I right about it? Everybody saying, hurry up, Pastor, get out of it. It says this. It says, watch this real quick. It tells us this. It says without a plan, we become a a slave to the lender. It says the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Mm. Let me put my feet on this for a second. A borrower is a slave to the bank, to all kinds of stuff. See, it says that the wicked, the wicked borrow and don't pay back. See, wicked folks borrow stuff, but they don't pay it back. That's Bible. They ain't pass the web. Watch this, because in the midst of planning, see, when you don't plan, you'll find yourself becoming a slave. You'll find yourself in credit card debt. You'll find yourself in all, why? Because you ain't planning, you ain't setting priorities. And now, watch this, you become a slave. You become a slave to the lender. Why? Because you ain't thinking through your stuff. Huh? Watch this real quick, last point, watch this. We got to understand, we say this all the time, and we say this, preachers, we say it all the time. God has called us to be the head and not the tail. But don't you know we misinterpret that? Because this is dealing with financial prosperity. See, what God is saying, if you obey me, do what I tell you to do, you will always be the head and not the tail. And what? In your wealth in your money. See, a lot of times we throw that out to cover everything, but he's dealing with your wealth and your money. And he says, watch this, if you do what I tell you to do with the money that I get you, watch this, you will always be on top and not the bottom. That's what he says here in Deuteronomy. This is a financial scripture. If we would just do what the Lord says, the Lord says, I will open up the heavens and the storehouse of his bounties to send rain on your land in season to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but you will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. If you pay attention, if you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day, carefully follow them, you will always be at the top. Huh? And never at the bottom. Let me close this thing on out. It's some good stuff. Anybody want to be wealthy? Let me give you the last principle. You got to go to work if you're able, right? If you're able. You got to be able to save. You got to be able to plan. Hold on to your seats for the last one. And then you got to be committed to give back to God. We got some folks that don't do nothing at all. But you say he's good. You say he's a way maker. If we treated God the way we treat people that we don't pay back, we're in bad shape. Watch this. Commit to giving back to the Lord. Did y'all y'all walk with me? You know, um, 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 when I was working for the government, anybody else know this? When you got a, anybody had an expense card? You ever have an expense card? And you, when you go away, TDY, you may go somewhere, whatever, and they will give you a card, a credit card, and you will go charge it, charge it, charge it, right? Right? Some of y'all remember. And then when you came back, you had to bring all the receipts to show forth all that you did. Anybody remember that? 
because that was an incorporative, a corporate executive thing, amen? You had to bring it all back. The way that you handle the corporation's money was important even to the livelihood of your job. My question is, why don't we treat God's money the same way we treat the bank and the corporation and the mortgage and all that? Why don't we treat my, God's money the same way? Why we treat God any less? So watch this, fourth principle. You got to commit, and we're going to talk about this in weeks to come, how to give back to God. We'll spend a lot of time talking about this in the weeks to come, but watch this. He says, honor the Lord with your, honor the Lord with your, with the first fruits of your, we're going to be talking about the tithe, right? And if this is the tithe, because we're going to understand the tithe, if you give a 20, and I'm giving, can I get practical? Say get practical, Pastor. And if I'm giving the first fruit, and if I give a 20, what I'm saying then is that God blessed me to make $200 that week. So here's a 20 for the first fruits, the one-tenth of my first fruit. Here's $20 because I made 200 But if you made $1,000 that week, and you say, here, throw in a 20, and you think that you did something, but you done made a thousand all week and you only give them a 20, that's not first fruits. That's called being disobedient. That's called being disrespectful. That's called being irreverent because if he blessed me with a thousand and then I only throw in 20, what I'm saying now is I'm lying to God and what I'm doing now, I'm robbing him. But instead of me taking the rest of that, I'll go to the restaurant, I'll go to the casino, I'll go to the store with the rest of God's money that I'm robbing him of. And so he says, shall you rob me? When I'm walking around for a thousand all week, but I think I'm doing something, but, and everybody will say, but you know you did something. No, I'm going to tell you right now, no, 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 that's not right. So he says here, then your bonds will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over. Did y'all get that? I'm almost, I'm done, I'm done. It's a sin and a shame how God's offering get put on the back burner. It's a sin and a shame. How he loses out to restaurants, cruises, houses, jewelry. New cars, education, everything under the sun, but he loses out when it's his money. And if you just, let me close. Can, I'm closing out. Someone said, get out of here. Go and close. Close, I know. Watch this. And look what it says, the promise. It says, you must, last scripture, Deuteronomy 15, 10, you must by all means lend to him and, and, and not be upset by doing it. Why the world are you upset because watch this as an offering unto the Lord? Oh, because we're doing a special offering to pay something. And you complaining? And you talking about your money? And why is it that I got to keep giving? Well, why is it that God keep giving to you? Why is it that he keeps, why is it that you keep getting a paycheck or, or, or social security, whatever you get? Why is it that he keeps doing that for you, but you keep getting upset what you got to do for him? For because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and everything you do. See, what's, let me close with this. If you reach in your pocketbook, in your wallet, and grab whatever change is in there, you know how we do. Well, let me see what I got. Put it in the offering plate. This, uh, put it in the offering plate. Amen? I hate to bust your, burst your bubble. That's not honoring the Lord. Running in the church and grabbing, grabbing change off your, off your, off your dashboard or, or in your console and saying, let me run that. That's not honoring God. Honoring God is in my planning that the money that God has given me, let me go first before the mortgage, before the BG, before the cruise, before the car payment, before all that other stuff, before the education, and let me go up top 
and let me give God what he has so graciously given unto me. Watch this. And let me go and put him first. Let me pray over it. Let me now offer it as a sacrifice so it be a sweet aroma in his nostrils. Nothing that I did hastily, but I done prayed over it. I done planned over it. And now I'm giving it word from the depths of my heart. That's how we honor God. We got a lot to talk about. Don't you? Don't run out. Don't, don't try to catch another church somewhere. <laughs> well, my girlfriend want me to come visit at their church this week. No, nah, no. Nah, this is your church. This is where you need to be. And I'm going to say it online. If you're online, you need to be in church. If not, you need to be on. Get this word. Because God is trying to take us to a different place. He's trying to take us to a different level. And watch this. You may not have done it right all these other times. But God says, today is the expected time. I'm going to show you how to do it now. Because it's not too late. I want to bless you now. I want to grow you now. I want to produce for you now. It's not too late. Don't close your heart. Receive what my word says and watch God take you up to higher heights and watch you open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing do I have I'm done you can cut it off do I got 10 people that can say I obey God I'm walking I'm not perfect but I want to do what he tells me to do and I've seen pastor I've seen the I've seen the floodgates of heaven open up and I've seen the blessings of God pour down. I, I've seen it pour down so much that it's overflowing. I see it pour down so much that I don't even know what to do with all the stuff that he didn't bless me with. He's been so good to me. He's been a way maker. He's been a promise keeper. Do I got anybody in here that says the Lord is good and greatly to be praised? He made a way out of no way. He blessed me when I wasn't thankful he was there. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. How the Lord brought us through. First lady, I remember when we had two nickels to rub together. We had to buy infamil and pampers and there was no, there was no running to no mamas and no daddies. But God says, I, I made a way for you. I remember when we had to ride around in a hoopty. When we had to put dollar worth of gas to get to work. I remember. But look at God. Look at what he's done. Look at what he's brought us from. Look how he made a way. We got to learn how to be obedient to the Lord. We got to learn how to give him what is due unto him. Is that all right? May God bless you. Heaven smiled upon you. Maybe one here today. You stand in need of this great salvation. Jesus came to give his life a ransom. That means he paid the price for sinful man. He only came for sinners. He didn't come if you all right, well to do, educated, got it all put together. No. Jesus came for sinners. And if you're a sinner and you recognize you never called upon his name, today is the day of salvation. Call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. Believe upon the Lord. Accept him. Call upon him while you're still able. He's standing at the door and he's knocking. He says, hear my voice. He's calling your name right now. Holy Spirit's calling your name. The Holy Spirit said, open up the heart, your heart, and let me come in. Let me come in and let me eat with you, sup with you, fellowship with you. Be your Lord, be your king, be your master. And if that's you today, watch this. Today, you give your life to Christ. We're going to welcome you to the family of God. Is there one? Just raise your hand. You said for the first time, Lord, save me right now. Lord, deliver me right now. Lord, be my God and be my king and come into my heart. If that's you, raise your hand. If that's you in TV land, right where you are. I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. If that's you in TV land, I want you.
to call that number on the screen. God bless you, brother. Today is a new day for you. Today is a new day for you, brother. Today you've come out of darkness and you've walked in a marvelous light. Today you got a brand new king, a brand new savior, a brand new Lord. His name is Jesus, the savior of the world. Amen. Anybody else in TV land, if that's you, call upon the name of the Lord right now. Call that number on the screen. And the Lord will save you right now. God bless you. We're going to keep traveling. God's money, God's way equals God's blessing. May God bless you in heaven. Richly smile upon you. Be blessed. Hallelujah. We give honor to the true and living God. And we thank him for this great Sunday, a day of worship. The Lord has been good to us. We know as a church, we come together on the first Sunday. First Sunday is always our communion Sunday. It's a day that we as a church come to observe the death, burial, and resurrection of a wonderful Savior. And we would be remiss if we didn't take time out to recognize all the great things the Lord Jesus Christ has done for each one of us, those who have called upon his name. And this one of the ordinances of the church, that one of the ordinances of the church Jesus he, he, he gave us was that we observe the Lord's Supper. Amen. The Lord's Supper is a time for all believers to recognize the grace, the mercy, and the love of a wonderful Savior. And I'm so excited that he will call each one of us into his family. I'm so excited that he, that he saved us and redeemed us. We don't deserve it, but he's been good to us. He's made a way for us. And we who are the church, his representatives on the earth, we should take time out. Um, he says, do it often. We should take time out to recognize this great work of redemption that he's done for us. So we come thanking him on this day, um, thanking him at the Lord's table. We thank uh, God the Father. We thank God the Father for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank him for the finished works that he accomplished for us on Calvary's cross, giving us redemption, uh, uh, forgiveness of sin, and giving us eternal life uh, to pass from this life and to be in his presence. And so at this time, we're going to take time out to do a holy communion for all those who are watching or present with us. We want you to take time out. It's a holy time. We want you to make sure everything is quiet as we meditate on the goodness of the Lord. And we ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins, uh, sins of omission and sins of commission. And we ask the Lord to cover us and, and to empower us and to strengthen us. We know that there's no power within the elements themselves, but there is spiritual power when we come humbly before his throne of grace and mercy and we bow before him. So let's take a few minutes and hold a communion as, as we begin this new month, um, recognizing all that Jesus has done for us. Um, the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, the 26th chapter, verse 26 and 28, it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and, and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said to his disciples, he says, uh, take and eat for this is my body. Um, and then he took the cup, then he took the cup and he gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant. Um, and he says, which is poured out uh, for many for the forgiveness of sins. And that's what we want to do. We want to recognize all that the Lord has done for us. So I want you at this time, wherever you may be, um, find your element. If you have a, a, if you have a cracker, get your cracker. And if you have a, a some grape juice, get you some grape juice. If you don't have grape juice, if you got some water, if you don't have a cracker, get you a piece of bread, get you a, a morsel of bread, because it's not so much the elements, but it's your heart. It's where your heart's at. And we thank you, Lord. I want you to grab your elements and let's just take a minute. Let's just thank the Lord. Lord, we thank you. Oh God, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for the finished works at the cross. We thank you for giving us a right to eternal life. We don't deserve it, Lord God. We're not worthy of it, but you loved us in spite of ourselves. And we thank you, Lord God, for, for hanging on that cross and taking the penalty that we rightly deserve, Lord God. And not only that, now you have clothed us, oh God, in, in your imputed righteousness. And we thank you, Lord. Now forgive us, Lord and strengthen us for the journey, Lord God. We pray for your covering all this month that we may bring honor and glory to you. And then, Lord God, we look for your soon return because we know that any moment now, you're coming back for your bride. And we cry out, Maranatha, come quickly. Lord Jesus, come quickly. So we thank you, we honor you, and we praise you, King of kings and Lord of lords, the almighty God. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. Let's take time out. Let's commune together. Amen. Let's take of the bread or the cracker.
and let's take up the drink. And we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. May you be glorified in our lives. We give your name all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that this communion was a great communion for you. And we want to make sure we keep up with the Holy Communion. Church, keep up with the communion because that's what God is looking for. Faithful church to be faithful members. May God bless you. And may heaven smile upon you. Thank you for joining us in our worship experience. And you can always visit us on our website at www.rbfchurch.com as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel. We want you to know that our God, he still reigns.